question in these circumstances, but could you talk a little about the business of, you know, beating the addiction? Yeah, it's a lot easier to get on it than it is to get off it. To me, it was a private... You know, Keith, uh, there's in England uh, kind of an underground top ten about people that are expected to die soon. I'm on the list. Hey, yeah, you're, you're, the, you're, you're taking the number one position in there. Great, okay, I'll this? let you know. Welcome to my channel, Steve, Flipside CT. I started off wanting to make a Some Girls documentary. As I proceeded, I started getting involved and reading up on the Toronto incident. It started growing and growing and getting huge. I was never really exposed to it in the sense of getting into the details and the flow. But after some time, I realized I needed to make a separate piece, a separate documentary just on this. I have to thank the following for providing their experience and knowledge. And without it, I could not do this. And I also support their books. There are plenty of details I'm not going to be disclosing. So check their books out. Give them a read. And I'm not mentioning anything that has not been exposed out there already. Chet Flippo, On the Road with the Rolling Stones. He was a writer for Rolling Stone magazine at that time. Jason Schneider, and Before They Make Me Run, great insight to Keith's bust. There's Victor Bacris, Keith Richard, The Biography. Barbara Sharon, Keith Richards, Life as a Rolling Stone. Of course, Keith's book, Life. And Ronnie's biography, his autobiography. Not all the resources I mentioned had all the information I'm about to present. I had to extract and coordinate all resources and compile a comprehensive full chronological flow of this time frame. Not everything was there. I had to piece these together. A challenge to create a coherent timeline of all these pieces. That is why I probably ignored a deep learning for this pivotal time until now. I'm just putting it out there that this documentary is different than my other ones due to the fact that finding archival footage or photos during this time was a uh, short challenge. I hope this presentation documentary is as informative and interesting for you as it was for me. The one piece of takeaway here, if Keith did not get busted, there would be no raw New York City Some Girls album. There you go. During Keith's testimony on his first day of his trial, his lawyer asked him what his being a lead guitarist meant. Keith replied in his fashion, it means I make a lot of noise. The courtroom attendees and the Stones had just laughed. January 10th to the 12th, 1977. This is when Keith went on trial in Islesbury Crown Court. It was from his Bentley car crash on the UK 76 tour, May 16th. He fell asleep and crashed in Newport Pagnell in the countryside. Marlon, Freddie Sessler, and two girls were in the car. They found a stained piece of paper thought to be LSD, and they also found a silver tube that had some pure cocaine on it. Summing up two days of evidence, the judge told the jury they had to decide two things. One, did Keith Richard know of the LSD which police found in his jacket pocket after the crash, or had one of what the judge described as his entourage put it there whilst wearing it? Two, 
the necklace in which the traces of cocaine were found. Was it the same one that Richard was photographed wearing four days earlier? And could he therefore have known of the presence of the cocaine? Well, the judge ended his summing up by saying that the jury must dismiss from their minds any feelings about pop music or pop musicians. Now, Keith arrived to the trials in a gold Rolls Royce, and he stepped out wearing a plain velvet black suit, white silk shirt and tie, and a scarf. Charges were recited, and Keith quickly answered, not guilty. Keith pleaded that they get plenty of gifts from fans, and the jacket they found the drugs in was not his. Mick had made it to the Tuesday afternoon session, along with John Phillips from the Mamas and Papas. Keith was glad to see them. Mick arrived after flying in from L.A. At the end of the third day, Keith was found guilty of possessing the cocaine. It was a 1,000-pound fine. The LSD, the one dose, was dropped. The jury was nine men and three women. The judge advised Keith that a third conviction meant jail. Upon completion of the trial, there was a press conference at a hotel ballroom. The questions and responses were very humorous. Keith Richard, how do you think this conviction is going to affect you and your music and the Rolling Stones? I don't know, I just want to get on with it now that it's over. You know, I just get on with what I'm supposed to be doing instead of uh, worrying about this, you know. Do you think it will have any effect then? I don't know, I might get a song out of it. What do you think about the way the case went? Um, I don't think anything. I, you know, I, I, I didn't know what to expect, and uh, what happened is what happened. I mean, you can I, talk about it very much because we haven't had a chance to talk to the lawyers or anything. Have you decided whether to appeal or not? That's what we haven't to decided. Them yet, so it's just really immature. Really you know? What made you decide to come Mick Jagger to the case? To be honest again. I never, I never miss a good case. I talked to him, and we decided from there. You know, do you think? Don't let's push. We've got plenty of room. Hang on a minute. This is ridiculous. Why did you come over, Mick? Because I wanted to be with Keith. <laughs> well, what did you make of the case? Um, no, um, no I don't we really want to say anything. <laughs> <I was> just, <laughs> no, because it, you know, may it may be, you know, may go to appeal. So I don't want to say anything. It's not my. Keith now would return back to Redlands, and comment: Going to court is an expensive habit. In early February. Charlie and Ian Stewart record with Ronnie Lane and Pete Townsend at Olympic Studios in London for the album Rough Mix. Now, Barbara Sharon was a journalist. She was also a music critic, writing columns for the Chicago Sun-Times, then NME while attending the University of Chicago. She moved to the UK after graduation. She also freelanced for Rolling Stone, Cream and Crawdaddy. She quit in 77 to write an authorized biography on Keith. Barbara would be hanging with Keith regularly. Her book, Keith Richards, Life as a Rolling Stone, came out in 1980-1982. Her book provides an in-depth feel of Keith's situation at that time and includes his home environment. She was with him at Redlands at this time and delivers this insight. Redlands was an addict's cavern with Anita and Keith. Then throw in the demanding and mini Keith acting as dad at times. Marlon was just seven years old. An unconventional and toxic environment. People coming and going and Anita at her drug peak and bored, bored out of her mind. Whether it was Anita or Marlon barking out orders, Keith just sank to his WTF situation. Anita screams, I'm bored, bored, bored with this house. Then Marlon screaming, I want to watch Murders in the Rube Morgue now. Now it's important to also bring to attention there was some normalcy. Both Anita and Keith would spend hours with Marlon and all of them play together as kids themselves. They would spend hours putting together dinosaur kits and work on painting models. Now there was a plan and Mick came up with an idea about doing a live album. They wanted to release it 
from the UK Europe 76 tour. The tour of the America 75 just was not consistent enough in the sound. They also wanted to record some more songs with great audio live sound in a small club to add. In addition, they wanted to do rehearsals and record for a new album. Now, with Keith not allowed into the U.S. due to prior drug arrests, and also England with their high taxes, it was decided to go to Toronto. It would be a great tax advantage to record. And Mick and the other Stones could fly to New York City as needed. They wanted to find a a club that would have a great sound, a small atmosphere, inviting fans, easy to manage, and not cause chaos. Avoid chaos. Back to Keith at the Redlands. Not being on the road or not being in the studio just drives Keith crazy after a while. He needs to perform. He needs to rock and roll. He misses the road tremendously. The people, the action, the playing live. So at this time, he's been up for three days now as he awaits his Canadian adventure to Toronto. Anita and Marlon are just on his case. Marlon adds his whining and demanding attention while Keith is playing a country and western song on the piano. And Keith just breaks down and tells Marlon, I had it today. You are the father. I'm the kid. Now go get me a Coca-Cola. Anita's later screaming for Keith to get into bed. She then demands some cocaine. And she also has not slept for several days. Anita is as stubborn as Keith. A dealer happened to be with Keith in the house and witnessing this fiasco. Anita comes down and slams a 20-pound note on the table and starts demanding coke. The dealer gives in, and he goes out and gets the drug. While this goes on, Keith is watching a soap opera on TV. This is when Keith gets a blast from Anita. I haven't been fucked in months. Is television more important than me? You think you're a Superman, don't you? Well, you're only Superman when you play guitar. You think you can handle drugs, but you can't. I know what I am. I've been that way for seven years. You pretend you don't have a drug habit. You simply go upstairs to the bathroom. You think people don't know? You are no different than anyone else. You can't handle drugs either. Keith was silently still. He was staring at the TV, but his eyes were swelling with water. Tears. Anita takes her drugs that were given to her and goes upstairs, and Keith eventually goes upstairs, but for a fix. At this time, Keith has gone the longest he's ever had without a heroin cleanup. This is repeated for days, the yelling, the playing, the people, the drugs, and chaos. The Stones were due to arrive in Toronto, Sunday, February 20th. On February 19th, Keith is in his study. Scattered around are incomplete melodies, song titles, lyrics, packs of cigarettes, all surrounding him. Keith is a traveling logistic nightmare for the Stones' assistance, that is. They are the ones that have to keep canceling and rebooking his flights. He's just so unpredictable with time. Why was Keith not leaving to get to Toronto so all the Stones can start rehearsals for the, at that time, five club dates they were expecting? Keith is always like this before leaving. This is what he does. He then takes the phone off the hook. He basically has some type of unconscious internal sabotage. Sabotage the the time clock deep within. Keith then gets a telegram from the Stones. We want to play. You want to play. Where are you? Keith and Anita and Marlon eventually work on packing. They depart Thursday, 
February 24th on British Airways. When they arrive in Toronto, Anita came with 28 pieces of luggage. During the flight, Keith had gone to the bathroom for a shot, and he stayed in there for three hours. He returned to his seat and threw the burnt spoon he used for the heroin cooking into Anita's bag without her knowing it. He does not know why or does not remember. Both Anita and Keith were carrying approximately two grams of heroin and cocaine. Something was wrong when they arrived in Toronto, and Keith did not see a stones rep meeting them at the customs to help them along. Next thing, Keith sees some men grabbing all the luggage. He thinks, oh, here are the reps, but nope, these are custom agents. They inspected the luggage. Ten grams of hash Anita forgot about was found, also a hypodermic needle and a blackened spoon. The heroin and coke were not found. Anita was ID'd as a common-law wife of Keith. Now, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police were on the scene also. They are the Federal and National Police in Canada, the RCMP. The RCMP filed a report and arrested Anita for 10 grams of hash. The other items were taken and analyzed, finding traces of heroin. A warrant for her arrest and to search her new residence was issued. Keith still does not know how that spoon got into that pocket. Anita was now booked on hash and heroin charges, but released after she signed off to appear in court March 3rd in one week in Brampton, 20 minutes west of Toronto. Ian Stewart arrived to pick them up and take them to the new residence, the Harbour Castle Hilton. They had three suites on the 32nd floor under the name Mr. Redlands. They had a bit of leftover smack that was not found in the search. Now, there was not much alarm or panic going on with them. Usually an arrest is handled with the best legal team representing them. They pay the fines, and this typical day in Keith's life is extinguished. Life is a stone, but it's really a roulette game, and the arrests they do add up. Now, Keith has still been missing rehearsals, and when he arrived to the suite, he crashed out. The Stones were in rehearsals February 25th at a film studio called Sign Vision. They now only had a week to rehearse to be a crisp and sharp for the club date. I don't have much detail of how the Elma combo was chosen, but... Peter Rudge and Mick, I believe, did do the scouting weeks prior. The El Macombo was known as an excellent sound setup, holds 300, 350 people capacity. It was built in 1947. It's located near the University of Toronto campus. And in the 60s, it was used for ballroom dancing on the second floor and burlesque on the main floor. It was bought in the 70s by two entrepreneurs. They wanted to take advantage of the university crowd. So they brought in live music to American blues and retro rock acts. They wanted to get a drinking audience inside. Sunday, February 27th, Anita was told There were some men in the hotel looking for Keith. She failed to alert Keith or any of the stone security. The search warrant goes into effect and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the RCMP, and the Ontario Provincial Police eventually find Anita's room that was listed under Mr. Redlands. Now for some reasons, Security was not around on the floors. 
It was found out later they were told not to be there. Now, I've heard two stories about how the police got into the room. One is that a knock on the door and Anita opened it thinking it was Marlon. And the second one was the police were dressed up as waiters and Marlon opened the door and let them in. Keith had recently just taken a shot. So there were 15 members of the RCMP and the Ontario Provincial Police that came in. Keith would not get up. He couldn't budge. They tried. After 45 minutes of them slapping him and dragging him around, he eventually did come around. Rolling Stone guitarist Keith Richards was arrested last night at the Harbour Castle Hotel here in Toronto. He is being charged with possession of drugs. They had to wake me up to formally arrest me. And that took him about two hours of dragging me around. Bam, bam. So I got like rosy cheeks and uh, oh, he's awake. You are under arrest. <laughs> oh, great. You know. I looked at the old lady and said, I've seen about seven years, babe. While he was out, they seized with about 15 minutes and wrote up a report. They took Keith's passport, the minister's permit to have Keith enter Canada, a hypodermic needle cover, plastic bag with traces of white powder, three colored pills, Harbor Castle sugar bags containing two grams of resin of hashish, gold foil paper with traces of white powder, a switchblade with traces of white powder, hypodermic needle with liquid still in the base, a brass lighter and silver ball, and a teaspoon, and a purple pouch, all with traces of white powder. Also, 22 grams of heroin in a plastic bag found in Keith's top drawer in his dresser. Keith admitted to the ownership, and he was arrested. It was English smack what Keith had hidden and they did not find at the airport search. They interrogated both Anita and Keith in separate rooms. Now, Keith was still concerned of the need and want of another fix. They had his stuff, so he was at their mercy. Now, he and his lawyer, they didn't realize what he was actually being booked for until later. Keith was brought to the Brampton station. This is where the search warrant was issued for Anita. The Brampton station is not part of Toronto, but it's part of the airport. Now, Keith, in his ride to the Brampton station, he calmly disclosed that he was a heroin addict for several years, and he brought with him what he had for his habit while he was going to stay five to six weeks in Toronto. He admitted he tried to kick it, but with the touring demands, he just couldn't. Keith had Peter Rudge and lawyer Clay Powell with him. Now, his heroin and trafficking and cocaine possession could lock him up for at least seven years. But Peter got the justice of peace at this Brampton station to release Keith out on bail for $1,000. The police at the station were not happy when Keith requested if he could have some of the heroin back until he makes some other re- arrangements thinking they would have some compassion. Keith's hearing was now scheduled for Monday, March 7th. And the items that were found and listed in the report were not presented or made known at this Brampton Justice of Peace session. The report also had some issues. Only the RCMP were listed in that report. It failed to mention the Ontario Provincial Police involvement. 
They were also part of the 15 officers in the Keith bus along with the RCMP. And as mentioned, Keith was brought to Brampton, which is not part of Toronto, but only a jurisdiction over the airport in Toronto where Nita was arrested. This complication would later cause problems in court. Also, Keith was out sleeping during much of the search, and the police report did not mention that Keith's name did not appear on the search warrant. These topics would also cause court issues later. Now, word was getting out to the AP Associated Press. They wrote, Keith was charged with possession of heroin for trafficking for an ounce of heroin. And it was being done after a week-long investigation at the Toronto airport. The RCMP were under observation three weeks earlier with the Stones when it was found out they were scouting for the location to play and record. Now the smoke is clearing totally on this bust and how and why this was moving quickly and with exaggeration. Heroin trafficking is serious seven years to life. The RCMP were not happy at all about Keith getting the $1,000 bail and getting off by the Justice of Peace. He didn't seem so concerned. They felt Keith was getting privileged, a treatment just made because he's a rock star, and it made the RCMP look bad. Keith's lawyer, well, he found a hidden radio transmitter, a bug in Keith's suite. He ignored it until the right time in court. The entire RCMP was a planned event. It looks like they were in with the hotel management also. Keith was just not cautious. What happened to security on the hotel floors? There were gaps in the Stones protocol procedures. The Stones, as you can imagine, were angry by now at Keith and Anita. There were proper procedures to take in traveling. This was ignored and disregarded, especially by Anita, who did not travel much with the Stones. Bill Wyman was actually the first one to ask Keith what he could do to help. Keith mentioned this in his book, Life. Bill had found Keith on the floor in the bathroom, gagging and vomiting as Keith was going through withdrawals. Keith replied, I need some shit. Bill did what he needed to do to help and come through. Monday, February 29th. The Stones returned to the hotel early morning after rehearsing at a warehouse for 10 hours. There is now a mob of journalists now waiting in the lobby. So the Stones, they enter through the basement service entrance. When they arrive to their rooms, they have many phone messages now of folks asking what is going on. The Stones lawyer, Bill Carter, was of course informed of the situation early on, and he immediately left for Toronto. The Stones' entire fleet came in. That would be Rudge, Paul Wasserman, the PR man. Carter knew he could not get representation in Toronto for Keith, but he worked on getting a powerhouse team together. The lobby was full of speculations, non-facts, some crazy groupies, cops, security, journalists, people coming out of the woodwork. So the rumors, they were flying. The Stone's future is in desperate trouble. Keith is slowly dying. He's not going to get out of this one. He'll be getting life. The RCMP is going to nail him, and he's going to be made an example. Now, after a Monday rehearsal, Mick, he decides... He has to get to New York City and visit his daughter, Jade, 
who supposedly had an appendicitis. Bianca was not around. She was in Europe. Now, the Stones, they still rehearsed without Mick while he was in New York City. Charlie had even asked, you know, where's Mick? You can imagine Charlie. And he was told, then he said, oh, good. I thought maybe he got fed up and just left. That's so Charlie. Keith was heavily focused and driving the band hard in these rehearsals. It was my own private problem. Uh, the, the reason people knew all about it was because certain powers that be wanted to drag it out in public. So I think it's 50-50. It's half their fault. Half my fault for doing it. Half their fault for letting everybody know I was doing it. Because they turned them on as much as I did. I never said do it. I never said do anything. Either to me, it was a private thing, and that's what I did. They went public on me, and then I had to deal with it, you know, and I did. So that's the way it goes. Now, not knowing a date yet, the Stones still needed to wait to hear from Billy, Preston, and Ollie to really find out when they were going to play at the Elma Combo. Initially, the Stones were scheduled to play the Elma Combo for five nights, but with Keith's bust and late arrival, that whole idea was blown out of the water. Now, March 3rd, Thursday, it was now known that Billy Preston also arrives. Mick arrives back from New York City, and they end up having a marathon rehearsal. They were also rehearsing new songs, playing into Friday morning at the Sign Vision until 8.30 a.m. Now, Peter Rudge, he presented a total press band for the decided Elma Combo show. Now, both Chet Flippo and Lisa Robinson were denied to see them. Now, at the Elma Combo, April Wine was booked that week until Saturday, March 5th. This was a great way outsiders would not get suspicious and know that the Stones were going to play there. The Stones were also in the midst and still moving ahead despite uncertainty between choosing MCA or Warner Brothers Atlantic, EMI. On Friday the 4th, Anita does appear in court in Brampton with lawyer Powell. Her next hearing is now scheduled for March 14th for her two charges. So after the Marathon rehearsals Friday morning. They return back to Harbor Castle to rest up for that Friday evening show at the Elma Combo. Now the road crew, they started bringing the gear into the Elma Combo. The second floor was ready and primed for a 4.30 practice rehearsal. This was before April Wide will be the opener. Now the key here has been the 16-track Fedco Mobile Recording Studio, the mobile truck that arrived from New York City. It was being manned by the great Eddie Kramer. He goes back to the Stones to 1967. He was there several days earlier, testing and recording levels while April Ryan was actually playing and performing. It's important to note also, during those rehearsals, Mick and Billy, they worked and created some early stages of Miss You. With it now being Friday, March 4th, and as mentioned, the Stones got two nights, two shows. The Stones now get a, another layer of chaos that comes on. Margaret Trudeau, the 28-year-old wife of the 58-year-old Prime Minister Pierre, she was looking to be removed from her duties of First Lady. She was informally separated from Pierre and looking to start her modeling career. She was labeled as Madcap Maggie. She was hospitalized for mental strain several times and unstable. She was just on her way to New York City on this March 4th Friday when she got a call from a friend that the Stones were in town and does she want to meet them. She arrived at the Harbor Castle and gravitated to Ronnie. 
She even took a room next to his. They were both going through separations in their marriage. Ronnie was the one that invited her to the show for that evening. Also note, she did have the RCMP bodyguards surrounding her. And yeah, she was a groupie. Chum Radio Station was part of helping out the Stones. The Stones wanted real fans to attend and that knew their music. Chum would have a contest. The prize was a chance to see April Wine play for free. April Wine was now billed along with the cockroaches for 6.30 p.m. The contest was, what would you do to see the Rolling Stones play live? They would select the top 300 for each of the two nights. So, of course, this was done a few days prior. The 300 fans met at Chum and boarded the buses, the winners. On the bus, they were played with and told that there's some bad news. There's a change to the show, and the fans started booing. They were told that along with April Wine, you're going to see the Rolling Stones. There was a moment of bewilderment, and then an expected blast of cheers, now realizing their new reality. Can you imagine that? This was the first club dates in 64. Well, they also played Marquee Club in 71. The Stones would be in such a small venue, an intimate atmosphere. It was also discussed on the bus, was this the last Stone show that's going to be happening? Upon arrival at El Macambo, it was surrounded by police barricades. Now, Chet Flippo was extremely close to the entire scene and the inner circle of the Stones. He was told by Wasserman, the PR man, and Rudge that he was not to show his face. Chet stayed in his hotel room a few floors below the Stones. He then got a call from a friend who was at the El Macambo saying the club has been overrun by Canadian reporters. So Chet ran down. After several tries, he took out his last resort of credentials, his New York City Police Department press pass, and in he goes. He did give an earful to Rudge and Wasserman for them telling him that it was banned from the photographers at press. Rudge would say, well, being this is Canada, we let some of their reporters in. Mick had dinner with Margaret just prior to the show, and he drove her in the limo to the El Macambo. The first show, as you could imagine, was loud and rocking. Bill Wyman would say the first half of the show was not so tight, but the second half was much better, but a good time. They played their classics, a heavy Route 66, the Honky Tonk Woman, Hand of Fate, Fool to Cry, Crazy Mama, Cracking Up, Around and Around, the debut of Melody, Starfucker, Worried About You debut, Let's Spend the Night Together, Little Red Rooster, Luxury, Brown Sugar, and Jumpin' Jack Flash. The crowd was dancing on tables, standing in chairs, and wine in Labatt's and Molson were spilling everywhere. Joints were lighting up. During Starfucker, Mick sings to Margaret, who is seated at the front row table. Starfucker, that's what you are. Anita was at the show also. Anita did meet Margaret prior to the show. And basically all she said was, fucking good to meet you. The Rolling Stones authorized photographer Ken Regan was the only one allowed in. The ladies in the audience rushed to the stage and were so much crazed being so close. Mick would say, we're going to have a contest for the best ass. 
but I think we got a winner here. Eddie Kramer would talk about and mention that this first show did have its issues. Some of it with the band, some of it with his issues. But the second show was much, much better in recording. Ronnie would have a fling with Margaret, but he was very cautious. Saturday, March 5th. As the Stones were doing their performing, the lawyers were still working away on Keith's case. That was coming up the following Monday. They were working on his defense. Now for the gig for that Saturday night, the U.S. press ban was lifted. Chet, he would get a sympathy pass and Lisa Robinson would attend also and they would sit at the front table, front and center, at the critic section. Keep in mind there were no gimmicks or props or even makeup with the Stones. Needless to say though, Keith did look a bit of mess, but the Stones would give an A++ performance. Us Stones fans wish they would release an official release of this show. We would hear Honky Tonk Woman, All Down the Line, Hand of Fate, Route 66, Fool to Cry, Crazy Mama, Manish Boy, Cracking Up, Dance Little Sister, Around and Around, Tumbling Dice, Happy, Hot Stuff, Star Fucker, Worried About You, Let's Spend the Night Together, the cover song, Worried Life Blues, It's Only Rock and Roll, Rip This Joint, Little Red Rooster, Luxury, Brown Sugar, and Jumpin' Jack Flash. I'm sure you remember very well how when you hear Love You Live, the Mick banter, you stop, you listen, and you smile. It's always great to hear. Now, when I was 15 years old listening to Love You Live, it was real hard to understand and interpret what Mick was saying. I just sort of brushed it aside and just took, for, took it for what it was. And as time went on, eventually realized what he was saying. Then prior to Little Red Rooster, we know and we can understand very easily Mick saying everything all right in the critic section, got plenty of drinks, have you? Hello, Margaret, how are you? All right. He also asked if the critics were enjoying it and then would say, you all know that we're doing this show for the critics. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. Everything all right in the critics section? Plenty to drink, again. you? Plenty right, you're right, nice with you. We have the critics like the show. Like the rest of them. Uh, Manish Boy, Mick would say, it's the bottom pincher. It's the bottom pincher from last night. Watch out for your bottoms, Keith. It's the bottom pincher. It's the bottom pincher from last night. Watch out for your bottoms, Keith. So apparently, there's a woman in the crowd that's pinching their asses. And that's what Mick is talking about. I'm going to mention for Happy, which was not recorded at El Macombo, might as well mention it now, that Mick does say at the end of Happy, thank you, Keith, do the horrendous to that if you can. Well, that's an inside joke with Ronnie and Keith being a dance move. Thank you, Keith, do the horrendous to that if you can. Of course, we know the band introductions. Now, Mick would scream again out to Margaret and also the critics' table during the Starfucker. And it's one thing to hear the young 62, 64 Mick belting out those R&B songs they covered. You know, the Manish Boy, the, the Round and Around, Little Red Rooster. But to me, when I hear a more mature Mick, a more seasoned Mick, now singing this, it's like night and day with his more mature voice. These songs make my hair stand up in the back of my neck. 
When I would turn friends on to the Stones, I would play side three of Love You Live loud. Then they would understand my excitement. The Stones would think that the arena crowds don't get those songs. So they didn't play them. They didn't play those older ones as much for that reason. Little did they know, we love it. The Stones surely elevated their level for the show, and Keith would have his bottles of JD to aid him. Something I didn't mention regarding the radio winners when they were arriving and trying to get into the club, fans were offered about $1,000 for their tickets. I don't think anyone gave it up. This experience had got to be one of the best, the most ultimate Stones experience that everyone could, anyone could witness. Mick would eventually dump his bucket of ice at the end of the water onto the press table, onto Lisa Robinson being held by Peter Rudge. A free show, free beer, on the Stones, and a free cold shower. As you can imagine, after parties were at the hotel, and one was hosted by Margaret. Sunday, March 5th, Margaret had mentioned in the afternoon she was awakened by a knock at the door. It was Marlon, and he was crying. He was looking for help for his dad. Anita was not around, and they both went to the suite, both Margaret and Marlon. Keith was on the floor in the fetal position. They both put Keith into bed, and Margaret stayed there with Marlon, and both assembled the model airplane. Anita would eventually return. Keith eventually woke up by 12 midnight that Monday morning. He got to Sounds Exchange Studios to listen with the other Stones and Eddie Kramer to the prior night shows. Prior to arriving Toronto, the Stones booked Sounds Interchange for six weeks. They expected to mix the live album there and work on new songs for a new album. But the bus just ruined these plans. Now we got to think, what if? What if they followed through? What if there was no bust? And what if they did record some new songs? So we could say now Keith's bust, did it save some girls? As they listened to the tapes and thinking they would make a full live album, the choices really went down all the way to four songs. The song still needed work. They needed some overdubbing. Mix Manish Boy needed more harmonica and backing vocals, Keith and Ronnie. They wanted to add some sound of the first show, which was much better of the audience than the second. Now, Keith's court appearance was on Monday at 2 p.m. He arrived, but he was a bit late. It was at the Old City Hall Courthouse. And at 12 noon, Chum Radio made an announcement that Keith will be appearing there. And it was told by Chet that the RCMP are the ones that encouraged Chum to make this broadcast at 12 o'clock. They thought that with their foul-looking Stones fans, the followers showing their faces at the courthouse could sway the public opinion. They also that they wanted to make an example of Keith. When Keith got near the courthouse door, a photographer grabbed Keith by the hair, and he tried to wrestle him down to the ground while screaming, deport the limey, while another woman, someone unknown, screamed, evil cocksucker. The hearing was closed to the public. Lawyer Powell, Bill Carter, Wasserman, and Chef Flippo were there, along with some other reporters. It was presented to have Keith's heroin charges to be moved to the next day, Tuesday, March 8th. Keith was then brought to a cell while the legal team and the prosecutor heard the news from the judge. A second charge of cocaine possession is being added. This was added due to the RCMP confirming that they did analysis and one of the bags that were seized 
had pure cocaine, one-fifth of an ounce. The judge told Powell to bring Keith in tomorrow for a secret hearing. This meeting was kept hushed. Keith would then go back to Sound Interchange later on and work on the overdubs for side three. But the show's over and some of the recordings look being looked at. They went back to Harbor Castle. There was now heavy panic and meetings and discussions going on to figure everything out. The Stones all had a private band meeting that still today, it's not known what was discussed. Bill Carter at this time took it a step further and told the Stones, the entire camp, that they need $25,000 in cash for bail. The RCMP wanted Keith. They felt he disgraced them. Now, Warner Brothers, Electra, Atlantic, had closed the contract on a new record deal for $14 million. Labels were fearing the bidding due to Keith and the Stones' future. It was Mick's relationship, though, with Amit Erdogan that helped this deal. It was Atlantic that put up the $25,000 cash and delivered it to the Harbor Castle. They even offered $200,000 more to help. But Bill Carter said offering more, more than $25,000, would be treated as blackmail. Margaret was talking and some outside lawyers were hearing. She said she will do anything to help Keith not go to jail. That had not much leverage as the RCMP wanted to nail Keith. Marlin was heard calling the Mounties worthless fuckers. Tuesday, March 8th. Peter Rudge had asked Chet Flippo to work on some positive press for Keith, even call the Time magazine. Chet was not affiliated with them and couldn't do anything with that. Chet was not Canadian, so he was not privy to the laws of the, this case and restricted from writing about it. He couldn't do anything. The legal team also asked Chet to show up in court again. This became a strategic move by the team. The legal team was chain smoking, not able to eat their breakfast, but drank cup after cup after cup of coffee. Keith woke up for his 2 o'clock appearance at 1.45 p.m. He arrived at 2.20, dressed somewhat conservative, a suit with a shirt and a silver tie. His posture and vibe was showing fear, much different than the day before. The prosecutor opened with the second cocaine charge and was bitching about the previous $1,000 bail. The judge cut him off and said that the bail should no longer be a matter. Basically, just drop it. Keith was escorted to a jail cell and taken out of the hearing room while they presented more information. Now, Clay Powell mentioned the cocaine charge from the search on February 27th. The court had said there would be no reporting or publishing of this hearing with Canadian reporters. But Jeff Lippo was there, the U.S. reporter. He was in the presence and, as we know, invited strategically by the lawyer team. So Powell mentioned this and they mentioned they should not discuss the second case. The judge agreed. So nothing could be discussed. This was a powerful tactic by Powell. This prevented that entire long list of items they found they could not be presented. Chet's presence helped save Keith, basically. The prosecutor, Scott, went back to the $1,000 low bail amount. He was still harping on this. He was presenting also, trying to present more facts about Keith and his luxurious living style. 
He wanted to add to the charge and to mention that this is, quote, Keith Richards of London and Jamaica. He also, as I mentioned, was complaining again about the $1,000 bail. Now, Keith gets introduced back into the courtroom, and this is when Powell unloads the news that Keith is ready to submit a $25,000 cash bail. The prosecutor then demanded he must be first retained and not allowed to be released. The judge asked Scott, you are concerned and worried he's going to leave? Prosecutor Scott didn't agree with the $25,000 bail proposal. And the judge said, I'm not concerned with the bail. Now, are you satisfied with the $25,000? Scott eventually said yes, but he wanted to keep Keith's passport, thinking he was going to leave. Clay Powell then took this moment to present the wireless transmitter left in Keith's room. This was humorous to the judge and other folks. So now a new date. March 14th, 2 p.m., was a new hearing scheduled date. It was also agreed that Keith will get his passport back. Now, bail. Bail is a payment that an arrested person gives to the court to ensure they will appear at the future court dates. Now, that same day after Keith got back, Mick telephone Keith. He didn't come see him personally to say he was going back to New York City. Keith was hurt by this. Ronnie, he had a hard time telling Keith that he was leaving also for New York City. He later admitted, Ronnie did, was that that was the hardest thing he had to do in their friendship. Anita would tell Keith her feelings that the band was letting him down. They were scared and distancing themselves, and that would help them. In the book Life, Keith would say it was a wise decision for them to get out. And he basically said, you fuckers get out of here. They're only going to involve you. Let me take the heat. It's my heat. The Stones would work on more of the overdubs back in New York City. March 9th, Wednesday. Keith and the legal team were extremely happy with how everything went down in the courtroom. Let us also say Chef Lippo, well, he was the first secret angel for Keith. The bigger news was directed and focused now with Margaret. Not sure where she was going, but they were trying to chase her down. And also these pack rack journalists were chasing Mick and Ronnie. And actually, a Toronto Star photographer got punched out by one of Ronnie's bodyguards. The scandalous tabloids posted their headlines, chasing Margaret, trying to understand why she's going to New York City. But she was there with a friend, visiting, going to see and watch Mikhail Baryshnikov in the ballet. Her friend, Princess Yasmin Agakhan, a daughter of Rita Hayworth. And also, she was just trying to pursue her modeling career. Keith, still in Toronto, he would take Marlon shopping. They would go to Eaton's department store. Keith would go to the record department while Marlon goes to the toys. Marlon picks up some Batman costumes and action figures and some American and British and German toy soldiers. Keith, He ends up buying Elvis records and blank cassettes. Keith and Anita and Marlon, they go visit Niagara Falls. As Keith looks at the falls from the Canadian side, he jokes and points over to the American side and says, Shall I jump? Now, both Bill Wyman and Charlie at this point leave Toronto. Now, the pastime... Keith, he would listen to the El Macambo shows. He would get lawyer visits and also visits from few friends. He'd be swimming at the second floor pool. He would read Sherlock Holmes, Frederick Forsyth, Dogs of War. He'd watch some TV, 
Monty Python and some British shows. And of course, he would play with Marlon. Both Chet, Flippo, and Peter Rudge were in New York City. They did meet and talk. And Chet asked, will the Stones tour without Keith? Peter right out and said, no. It will not be the Stones without him. If the courts find him guilty and convict him, it will probably be the end of the Stones. Now, both Chet and Peter did have to go back to Toronto for that hearing on March 14th. Now, it was Ian Stewart that still stayed with Keith. And he suggested, while Keith was waiting and passing time by, why not put down some of his own tracks at the studio? This now concludes the end of the first part here. And up and coming will be Keith doing some solo work, going to rehab, Love You Live, and then moving on into the world of some girls. I hope you got some insight here. I hope you were pleased. And let me know. I appreciate your time to watch this. It's a real pleasure to be able to deliver this type of information to you.